<laughs> Maybe they're all irrational. Thank you. Um, so I, I chose this topic because I often get asked my opinion about Aperi's theorem. And so here's, here's my opinion. The first part is uh, historical. And then the second part, I'll try to put some geometry into the picture. And in the third part, I'll talk about uh, dinner parties. Um, so we begin with the anachronistically named Riemann zeta values, zeta of n, which are the sums of the reciprocals of the nth powers of the integers. And a very famous problem in the 17th century was to compute um, zeta 2. And as we all know, this was solved by Euler in the 1740s, who proved that zeta of 2 is equal to pi squared over 6. And in general, he proved that zeta of 2n is pi to the 2n times a rational number. And that rational number is given explicitly by um, a Bernoulli number. And so you can ask yourself the question, is uh, zeta of 3 a rational multiple of pi cubed, for example? And the answer is that we don't know. So we have um, a very old conjecture, um, which states that the odd Riemann zeta values, zeta 3, zeta 5, zeta 7, and so on, should be algebraically independent over the field Q adjoined pi. So in other words, if there is a, a polynomial in pi and odd zeta values, which has rational coefficients, then, um, then it should be identically zero. There's no, poly there's no non-trivial polynomial relation between these numbers. OK, so extremely little is known about this conjecture. And I'm going to give practically the totality of known results on this one slide. The first result um, of the famous theorem due to Lindenmann in 1882, which is that the number pi is transcendental. So by Euler's theorem, we know, therefore, that the even zeta values, zeta of 2n, are all irrational numbers. Then um, a spectacular breakthrough occurred in 1979. Um, when Aperi proved that the number zeta 3 is irrational. And I'll, I'll come to that in a minute. And um, this is remarkable because um, it took several hundred, it was the first progress after several hundred years. And it's also remarkable because Aperi was 65 years old when he proved this result, his first major result. So it gives, I think it's an inspiring story. <laughs> it gives hope to us young people, perhaps hope to the older people as well. Um, and it was recognized. Yeah, but actually, he never published. There's no paper in which he proves this. It was, um, it's been published. It's very hard to trace the origin of this, this, this subject. The next big breakthrough um, was in 2000, due to Rivoal and Ball and Rivoal. And they proved that the, um, th they proved a quantitative result. But the qualitative result is that the vector space spanned by the odd zeta values is infinite dimensional. So in particular, um, infinitely many of the odd Riemann zeta values are irrational, but we don't know which ones. And then this method was, was pushed very hard by lots of people, and the best result that can be extracted is the following theorem by Zudelin, which is that one out of the four numbers, zeta 5, zeta 7, zeta 9, and zeta 11, is irrational. But it is still not known whether zeta 5 is irrational, or perhaps more interestingly, um, if 1, zeta 2, and zeta 3 are linearly independent, and nor is it known if zeta 3 is a rational multiple of pi cubed. So we know almost nothing about this question. Okay, so how do we prove irrationality of a number? So we start with um, a real number, alpha, and we want to construct linear forms. So linear combinations of 1 and alpha where a, n, and b, n are rationals. Typically, a, n will be an integer. So to think of this, um, we will think of this as being an approximation of alpha, uh, b, n, over a, n. So this is a, a rational number that's going to get very close to alpha. So to quantify this, um, you s assume that these linear forms go to 0 exponentially fast and are less than epsilon to the n for some epsilon. Now define um, dn to be the common denominator of these two numbers, a n and b n. So dn times a n is an integer, and dn times b n is an integer. And we assume that the, um, 
we assume that the okay we assume that the denominators grow grow exponentially um, d to the n for some positive real number d. So so far this is not very hard to do to satisfy these two conditions, but the crux of the matter is that they should be related, and the the the, d, the, denom the growth of denominators should not be too big. So d times epsilon is less than one. So the, in that case, then the claim is that the number alpha is irrational, and it boils down, and in fact all these proofs boil down to this fact, that there is no integer n strictly contained between 0 and 1, which I think we agree on. Um, and so the, the, the sort of motto is that we only need to construct um, linear forms, which are small, that's the first point, small than epsilon, small linear forms in 1 and alpha whose denominators are small. That's the second and third point. So here's the proof. Um, so proof by contradiction. Let's assume that alpha is a rational number. Ah. Yeah, great. So let's assume that alpha is, is p over q, where p and q are uh, integers. And then remember the, the, the first assumption. I can't get this to work. First assumption was um, that the linear form was small. So when we plug in alpha equals p over q, we get this equation here. So sufficiently large n. Now multiply through this equation by q and dn, and we get uh, 0 less than dn a n p minus dn p n q. And on the right-hand side, we get q times dn epsilon to the n. And if you remember by the second assumption on the growth of denominators, the dn is at most uh, a d to the n. And then by the third assumption, d times epsilon is less than 1. So this quantity here on the right goes to 0 exponentially fast. And for some sufficiently large n, um, it will be less than 1. So the upshot is that we get um, something wedged between 0 and 1. And this something um, here is dn, dn a n times p minus dn b n times q. And the, the assumption on the denominator, the definition of dn was that it was the denominator of an. So this is uh, an integer. Uh, dn bn is also an integer. So the whole thing is an integer. And we've constructed an integer between 0 and 1. So that's a contradiction. I hope that should be relatively clear. So now, as a warm up, um, I want to prove the irrationality of log of 2. And for this, you take um, a rational function f of x equals x times 1 minus x over 1 plus x. And you take a differential form, uh, a differential one form, omega. And the thing to observe is that the denominator of omega is the same as the denominator uh, of the function f. So this will be the case in, in almost all the examples I'm going to look at. And now you write down a family of integrals, i n, which is the integral from 0 to 1 of this rational function raised to some the nth power times omega. And the claim is that this gives small linear forms in 1 and log 2. So let me uh, just tell you why. So this is an exercise, but it's might as well do it. So by changing variables, this is the integral of 1 minus y, 2 minus y, to the m over y to the m plus 1 dy. So you'll certainly agree with me that i naught is just the integral of dy over y from 1 to 2, and that's certainly log 2. So we expect to see log 2s. And then to prove the, the claim here, you can just expand out this polynomial in the numerator, 1 minus y, 2 minus y, dm, and integrate it term by term. And the only remark is that integral from 1 to 2 of... 2 to the m minus 1, uh, y to the, sorry, this should be n, my apologies. Uh, m, so you get a bunch of integrals like this. This integral is always an integer with a denominator m plus 1 whenever m is greater than or equal to 2. So when you expand this out, you get a sum of integrals like this. 
and each one will contribute an m plus 1 to the denominator. And so you're going to get a, 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 a 1 over 1, 1 over 2, 1 over 3, up to 1 over n in the denominator. And the denominator will be the least common multiple of 1, 2, up to n. So that's important. That's going to come up again and again. So you always get this least common multiple of 1 up to n coming in. So now you need um, the prime number theorem. So the prime number theorem gives you an estimate for this denominator, and it's basically bounded by exponential of n. And finally, so in this irrationality criterion, we needed to, to see how fast these linear forms tend to zero. To do that, uh, it's very easy. So let me remind you that f of x equals x1 minus x over 1 plus x considered on the unit interval, and it's bounded above by x times 1 minus x, which is going to attain its maximum at x equals 1 half. And the maximum is 1 quarter. So we get that the absolute value of this integral is less than 1 quarter to the n. So now we can apply this irrationality criterion um, to these linear forms. Epsilon, the thing that measures how fast it goes to 0, is 1 quarter. The bound on the denominators is the number e, 2.7181. And so you compute that e divided by 4 is about 0.679. And that happens to be less than 1, and you're very happy. So log 2 is irrational. And of course, the proof is not hard. It, the whole difficulty is trying to find the approximations in the first place. How do we find these integrals? OK, so now um, uh, I turn to Aperi's proof of irrationality of zeta 2. So I learned recently that this, so this proof is given by a beautiful paper by Boykers. It's very short, in 1979, I think. But I learned that Cordoba and possibly Bombieri had similar ideas. So now you look at a, an integral in two variables over the unit cube, where x and y are less than 1, of, as usual, a rational function to the n times omega, where the rational function is this thing in two variables. And, and that's omega. So now you have to work a little bit, but you can show that, that these integrals are linear forms in 1 and zeta of 2. Uh, a similar argument to this one shows that the denominators are bounded by dn squared. It's squared because it's a double integral now. So the constant d is going to be e squared. And the, the constant epsilon that measures how fast it goes to zero, you work out the maximum, and it's an exercise, and you get this strange quantity, 5 square root of 5 minus 11 over 12. And then you hold your breath, and you compute this product, and you find that it's 0.6627 is less than 1, and you jump up and down. Now, zeta of 3, um, so now you look at this triple family of triple integrals, same format as before. I won't talk you through it. Um, this time you can show, and it gets more difficult, but you can show this time that it gives linear forms in 1 and z of 3. And the denominator is now bounded by this least common multiple of 1 up to the n cubed, because it's a triple integral. So our, the constant d is e cubed. And this time the, the constant epsilon, which is computed from taking the maximum of f on this cube, is now the square root of 2 minus 1 to the fourth power. And now, again, you, you multiply these two numbers together, and you check that it's 0.59, which is significantly less than 1. And that proves the irrationality of zeta 3. So it looks easy. Um, and many people, over many years, many decades, have tried to construct integrals that give linear combinations of 1 and zeta 5. And sure. No. No, no, no. Yeah. It, it's, it's got a lot more symmetries than that. I'll come to that later. Um, so the last inequality always fails, because if it didn't, I, I'd be giving a different talk. So we know about it. So, so that we have to try a different approach. Before, I'm going to skip this. Before I do that, let me mention some, some work that's not very well known, but I think is interesting. And um, it's called the group method. 
So now instead of having one parameter n that goes to infinity, take five parameters h, i, j, k, and l. And um, in, in 1905, a mathematician called Dixon wrote down this integral. So if you put all the parameters h, i, j, k, and l equal to n, you get exactly the Boyka's integrals for zeta 2. Okay. And actually Dixon in his paper observed that there's a, um, a symmetry of these integrals. Let me write it down. And we'll, we'll see very clearly why this is the case later on. That this family of integrals oops, <coughs> is symmetric under cyclic permutation of the indices. And later on in 1996, Rhin and Viola proved that these give, the, this more general family of integrals give linear forms in 1 and zeta 2. And they found a, um, another hypergeometric type <coughs> symmetry. Um, J factorial K factorial equals I K plus L minus I. <coughs> they found this other symmetry. And if you combine these two symmetries, they generate um, a very big group, which has of order 1440. And the idea now is that instead of letting, setting all the parameters to n and going to infinity, you let the parameters go to infinity at different speeds. So you let h equals h naught n, k equals k naught n, and so on. So where h naught... Sorry, i is this integral. Yeah, my apologies. i is this integral. This, this, can come, this comes from integrating Gauss's transformation for F21. And so now the idea is you're going to choose H0 and K0. So these are integers like 13, 9, 11. Choose them in some clever way and let them go to, in, to infinity. And your constant epsilon gets a lot worse. But because of this sort of identity, you can um, prove that certain prime factors don't occur in the denominators. And using this trick, they can get much, much better approximations to Z2 and they hold the world record for the irrationality measure of zeta 2. It took them over 10 years to find the corresponding family for zeta of 3. So again, you take the same integral Boyk has had, and you put arbitrary parameters in there, h, l, k, s, j, so on. But um, you need these tricky constraints, j plus q equals l plus s, and k plus r greater than or equal to h. Otherwise, if you don't have this, you get linear forms in 1, zeta 2, and zeta 3. And what you'll prove is that the dimension of this space is greater than or equal to 2, which is not interesting, because we already know that zeta 2 is irrational. And this is going to happen again and again. The fact that you know something prevents you from making progress. But they found these constraints to kill the zeta 2, and again, they get the world record irrationality measures for zeta zeta 3. Okay, so now I'm going to change tack and consider um, something over q to the alpha and, and alpha is about 5 or something. It's conjectured to be 2 um, and there's a whole series of, there's a huge literature of people yeah. Um, but the approximations are much, much better than I think. So now we want to look at um, linear forms in, in several real numbers. Okay, so we have before r was 2, and now we're going to look at several real numbers, because this is what comes up more naturally, as we've seen. So suppose that we have a linear form in alpha 1 up to alpha r. And this time I want to clear multiply through by denominators to assume that all the coefficients are integers. Okay, so now there's an integer, an integer form. And the assumption now is that the size of the coefficients grow exponentially at most eta to the n. So before we just had a bound on denominators, now, now this is a bound on numerators and denominators. It's more, a bit more tricky. And um, as before, the linear form goes to zero like epsilon to the n. That's the same. same. So there's a subtlety here that I'm not going to go into. And then the conclusion, if you apply Nestrengo's well, Nestrenko proves that if you have these conditions of very small linear forms in many numbers, 
then you can get an, uh, an effective lower bound on the dimension of the space bound by these numbers in terms of epsilon and eta. And this is great. You can even prove independence. If your linear forms are superb, you can get um, linear independence of all our numbers, if you're lucky. Of course, we can't in practice. So the idea now is um, to try to construct linear forms in many numbers. So for example, 1, z to 2, z to 3, up to z to n. And if these linear forms were excellent, then you'd deduce that they're independent, and you'd be on a good shape for proving this conjecture. Unfortunately, typically, the linear forms we get are very poor. And um, just by way of example, let's say uh, typically we're going to get linear forms in, for instance, in z to 5, we're going to get 1, z to 2, z to 3, z to 4 and z to 5. And typically, you can show that the dimension is at most 2, at least 2, or if you're very lucky, perhaps 3. And again, this is useless because we already know that 1, z to 2, and z to 4 form a three-dimensional vector space. So what you want to do is try to kill, to f to, to kill the, the parasite z to the <coughs> So this is what Born and Rivoal did in 2000. So they introduced something called very well poised hypergeometric series. And um, if you're familiar with hypergeometric series, there's always a way to write that as an integral. But those integrals are actually degenerate in, in a certain sense. Um, so it was significantly later when Stefan Fischler, building on the work of many people, including Zobin, found this integral representation for the linear forms of Born and Rivoal. So you have to fish this out of the literature. It's of the same shape as before. It's something to the power n. So there's an n everywhere, um, times some differential form. Except there's also a little parameter r. There's an extra, extra tweak you can do. There's a sort of second parameter r here that you can also play with. Uh, but essentially, it's the same as the integrals we saw before. It's an integral over a hypercube of a function to the n times a differential form. But it's quite a tricky. Um, integral. Um, k plus 1 fk, k plus 1 fk of, there's our ak, yeah, well, I, I, that's what I don't like. Um, I'm trying to put some geometry in this. So, um, the well poised means that the, the, the sums of each column are, are equal. And very well poised is some bizarre condition that I'm going to get wrong, but something like a1 equals half a0 plus a plus 1. So you have to think of this. And there are huge formulae that don't fit on the, on the slide, so I didn't put them in. So the miracle is that these integrals give linear forms in just the odd zeta values, when a is even. And when a is odd, they give just the even zeta values. So now apply Nestorenko's criterion um, to, the first, to, to the first ones, to this uh, sequence. And it will prove exactly that. Um, the vector space spanned by these numbers has infinite dimensions. <laughs> the dimension tends to infinity as a goes to infinity. It does it very, very slowly, but it doesn't matter. It, it goes to infinity. And what I think is very interesting is that you can, um, you can apply it to the second line as well. And recall by Euler's theorem that these even zetas are all powers of pi. And this will give a, a second proof of the transcendence of pi. And what's elegant about this is that these, these linear approximations are pretty rubbish. They, um, they show that the dimension is only about the logarithm of the number of terms. But even with a very bad approximation, you deduce the strongest possible result, which is transcendence. So, so if we could construct linear forms in z to 3, z to 3 squared, z to 3 cubed, then we might get the transcendence of z to 3. Um, yep. OK, so this is my cop-out slide. Um, I'm not going to say much about this. The, the linear forms occurring in Aperi's proof are of this form, a n z to 3 plus b to b n. Actually, there may be a 2. I, I may have forgotten. Maybe twice a n z to 3. I apologize. I might and this is a very famous sequence of integers, 1, 5, 73, 14, 45, and so on. And they are solutions to a recurrence relation. Um, that's kind of clear. When you have any family of integrals of this type, you have a picard fuchs equation you're going to get recurrence relations. Um, 
but this family has been discovered and rediscovered many times uh, in the literature. It's related to modular forms, to mirror symmetry, to all sorts of interesting geometry worked on by people in the audience, including Matt and many others. I'm afraid that the history lesson has to end here, but this has spawned a vast amount of literature uh, that grows out of this subject, and um, I'm afraid I have to stop at this point and move to part two, which is geometry. Okay. So the moduli space of curves of genus zero is the geometry that we're interested in, and um, yeah, so we take uh, P1. So if you're not familiar with the notation, P1 will mean two things. It'd be the Riemann sphere, or it will be the real line at infinity, which I will think of as a circle. And so um, the space of configuration, end points in P1, is the space with n distinct points on the Riemann sphere. And as we all know, the group PSL2C acts on um, the Riemann sphere by projective transformations, and it'll move all these points simultaneously. And the moduli space M0N of genus zero curves with n ordered marked points is the quotient of this configuration space by the automorphism group. So um, as we know from undergraduate days, you can always this group action is triply tra transitive, so you can always assume that the first point is called zero, is at zero, the second point is at one, another point is at infinity, and then we have the remaining points over here somewhere. So m zero n is simply the space of points in P one, sort of n minus three points in P one that are all distinct and all different from zero, one, and infinity. And my, my claim is that, that most and probably all known irrationality results are related to the real points of this space. So examples, M03 is just a point. M04 is P1 minus three points, a space that uh, some of us are acquainted with. Here's a picture of um, M05. So I'm going to draw it. So zero, one, infinity, zero, one, infinity. And um, so what I do is I, we have these five points, Z1, Z2, Z3, Z4, Z5. And we put Z1 at zero. We call Z1, Z2, T1, Z3, T2. Z4 will be called one. And Z5 will be called infinity. These are just names for our five mark points. And they give coordinates. <coughs> That's the picture. And the, the symmetric group acts on this space by permuting the mark points. In these coordinates, it does something quite tricky on, on the hyperplanes. It's quite interesting. OK, so now the, um, the set of real points of this moduli space are in one-to-one -one correspondence with n marked points on a circle up to automorphism. <coughs> um, so we'll think of, we have a circle, S1, and say we have five points on a circle. Okay. And a cell um, will be a connected component of the real moduli space. So it's, um, it's one of these regions here. There are, in fact, 12 regions in this picture. And a cell is in one-to-one -one correspondence with dihedral orderings on the mark points. So a dihedral ordering is, is just a cyclic ordering up to modular reflection. So if we flip the picture, or if you want to orientate the circle the other way, then they define equivalent dihedral orderings. Okay. In other words, it's the, the stabilizer is, is the dihedral group of order 2n. So I hope that's 
Um, so the standard cell is, so, so this, um, the, the, the set of points where the, the five marked points are in the real line in this dihedral order means that Z1 less than Z2 less than Z3 less than Z4 less than Z5 less than Z1 or it's reverse and cheating a little bit but this if we translate this into the into these new coordinates at 0 less than T1 less than T2 less than 1 less than infinity so that exactly corresponds to this region here okay. and when what happens is when two points come very close together and pass through each other that's when we we pass into an adjacent cell okay and so let me uh, so this I can um, denote, instead of drawing circles, I can write this 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and it's clear that I mean the points around a circle in that order or the other order. And by that token, by the same token, this cell will be 1, 2, 4, 3, 5, because it will, if you work it out, it will give 0 less than T1, less than 1, less than T2, and that's exactly the square that I've indicated. Okay, so this is x delta naught means the standard the, the standard ordering so this is delta naught the standard ordering once we've fixed the bijection between our marked points in one to n and here it is then okay. so obviously the symmetric group on on n letters is going to permute um, these uh, set of cells So now I want to construct some integrals. So the uh, choice of a cell is going to serve as a domain of integration. Um, so for now, we just take, um, take this cell as a domain of integration and then take any differential form that's uh, of the right degree. So it's an n minus 3 form. So incidentally, the, the dimension, I should say the dimension, m0 n, n minus 3. And um, omega will be any regular algebraic n minus 3 form, and we can integrate it over the cell. It may or may not converge. Uh, re oh, yeah, along the, well, regular on, on M0n. So it's on M0n bar with singularity. It can have poles anywhere along these hyperplanes. For now, anywhere. So it can, it can I indeed have poles along the boundary of the domain of integration, and it will diverge. So no, no constraints for now. So that when I write an integral, it may be infinite for now. Um, so the, as I explained, the, the, the domain of integration is, is always a triangle. It's a simplex. So it's this increasing sequence, this triangle here. And you can always write such a regular um, uh, n-3 form as a linear combination of um, differential forms like this. So here, you get a product of Ti's, 1 minus Ti's, and Ti minus Tj's to a certain power. And these powers um, can be integers. Um, so these integrals are very close to what physicists look at in what's called um, superstring perturbation theory, tree level superstring amplitudes. So a theorem I proved in my thesis um, is that when this integral converges, then this um, integral is a linear combination, not of zeta values, but of multiple zeta values, which are defined um, as a nested sum. Um, they depend on R integers now, N1 up to NR, and uh, they were defined by Euler, probably uh, uh, in relation to the same transcendence problem. It's quite likely. So a quantity um, that's of interest is, is the, the weight, which is the sum of the, inter sum of the indices here. And the, the multiple zetas which occur in such an integral have weight bounded above by the dimension of the, the space. So if we're on a two-dimensional space here, we'll get multiple zetas of weight at most two. And we don't need to know anything about multiple zetas for this talk, except that um, the ordinary Riemann zetas are certainly multiple zetas and products. In fact, any polynomials in ordinary Riemann zeta 
values are examples of multiple zetas, but there's much more as well. Okay, so the proof of the theorem is, um, the, yeah, the proof of the theorem is effective. Um, and very recently, um, there are implementations to compute these due to uh, two physicists, independently, Christian Bogner and Eric Panzer. Um, and the reason why they, they're interested in these is because the similar the generalization of these methods gives ways to compute Feynman amplitudes in, in high energy in quantum field theory. So it's very useful. And these physicists have kindly implemented these, and you can, um, you can uh, do examples to your heart's content. I say this because in the literature it said that my theorem is not effective, but um, obviously it is. So um, um, you get bounds on the denominators. If you go through the proof and think about how it works, you can, in principle, produce bounds on the denominators and numerators. So what I'm trying to say here is that all the tricky part of the Apparis proof, we have this epsilon and, and denominator bounds. In principle, um, it's all taken care of. So it will stick to some? You get, you get everything. No, so there's no represent, you know, um, you get all multiple zetas and there's no, um, no restriction to a basis, no. It, it comes out, um, it's some inductive argument uh, where you integrate, you, you integrate, you just take this thing and you, you integrate, you find a primitive and you apply Stokes' theorem and the, and the boundary of the domain of integration is again a moduli space because moduli spaces have this recursive operat structure. And you, you, get, you get identities, absolutely, you get a relations, yes. And so you, you take primitives in a, in a bar construction of differential forms, you prove that there's no cohomology. And at the end you get something, but next time you do it you'll get a different answer. So it's not a canon. You feed in this integral and it gives a, a linear combination of multiple. Yeah, so this is why I started thinking about this again. It's an old project because these guys did this work and, and it's now possible to experiment. So. Um, so now the general recipe then is, is what we've been doing all along. It's take, take um, a, a standard cell as your domain of integration and integrate um, a differential form like before and then times any rational function to the power n. And that gives you some numbers. But now if you choose your function f to vanish along the boundary of your standard cell, then it's, these integrals are going to go to zero very fast. So if this is a standard cell, the function f is sort of zero to very high order along the boundary. It's going to be very, very flat. And it's, the function is going to attain its maximum in some sort of small region in the middle. But if, if the Taylor expansion is, is, is trivial up to very high order at the boundary, you can sort of see that this is going to be a very maximum is going to be very small. It's going to go to zero exponentially fast. So if we play this game, we get exponentially fast, exponentially small linear forms, and they're going to be linear forms in multiple zetas by the previous theorem. Um, so we get small linear forms in multiple zetas, and it gives a huge <coughs> supply of things to which we can apply Nestor and Chris criteria. So as I said before, the sort of D and epsilon part of the proof is taken care of. The difficulty now is to try to kill parasite zeta values. So all the, the transcendence problem can be rephrased as a, a, a pure problem of algebraic geometry, which is find conditions on the rational function f and the differential form omega to force some of the coefficients in this linear function, this linear form to vanish. So that's translated it into a more familiar problem. And um, I don't know how to solve this. All I can do is to show that the sort of the subleading term, uh, I know how to force that to vanish, the subleading coefficient. That's all I can do. And that's what I'll explain in the third part of the talk. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, but but that never. You you could do that. Yeah. So we have. Pro so I'm I kind of I'm fed up with this experimental stuff. I want to. <laughs> it's I don't have the temperament to, to to deal with these sorts of. So um, yeah, 
everyone is welcome to, to play with this and, and uh, see what you can do. But that approach is what people did before. They tried to construct approximations to 1 and z to 5. And then you've got this d epsilon thing never works. I think it's more um, productive to have linear forms that are good and then understand the vanishing. And that's a problem in algebraic geometry. So I have one technical slide because um, there's an algebraic geometry seminar at the moment. So the non-algebraic geometers can go to sleep and the algebraic geometers can wake up. Um, essentially, I don't want to say much about this. The, there's a, um, a mixed hot structure that behind these integrals and you can reformulate the vanishing problem to uh, a stronger condition which is computing that the, the weight graded pieces of this mixed hot structure vanish in certain degrees and if you can do that then you certainly get vanishing so here's a, a vanishing problem find boundary divisors on moduli spaces such that the corresponding mixed hot structure is of this shape it's a very strong requirement but it will do the job and that would certainly give linear forms in 1 and odd zetas. And I can solve it for n equals 5 and n equals 6, which is the case of Apéry. But be warned, for, M z for zeta 5, you're on M08, and it has 119 boundary divisors. So choosing two sets out of 119 is, uh, is it gives some indication of why zeta 5 is so hard. So now, so we've created a huge box um, with lots and lots of linear forms. Um, uh, the search space is enormous. So now I want to focus in on a, on a more specific construction and narrow the search space down. And that will be the dinner party construction. Okay. So now, so before I took one um, dihedral ordering and it gave us a, a domain of integration. So to make this, the situation symmetric, I'm now going to choose two dihedral orderings. And they're going to be called delta and delta prime and they correspond to two different connected components. For example, uh, this one and this one. Which is the same as this, by the way. So now I'm going to define... So the, the first, dif first dihedral structure gave a domain of integration. Um, the second dihedral structure is going to give a differential form. And so you first write down this differential form it's the product of all, on the configuration space, first of all. It's the product of the DZIs. And then you just take the product of the successive differences in this ordering, in the denominator. So that's a differential form on configuration space. It's PSL2 invariant. That's, that's easy to check. And there's a standard way, if you choose a rational invariant volume form on PSL2, that you can get it to descend onto the quotient, onto the moduli space. And it'll give a form of degree uh, three less. I'll explain how to do that in a minute. So we get, for every dihedral structure, we get a, a canonical differential form up to a sign. Now, um, we're going to construct a rational function. So F tilde, this is a rational function on the configuration space. It's the product of the successive difference between successive points in the first dihedral ordering, delta, divided by the successive differences in the second dihedral ordering, delta prime. And this is also PSL2 invariant, and it will descend um, to a function, a rational function, on the moduli space. And then I can define the basic cellular integrals to be the family of integrals where you integrate over one of the the, the, the cell defined by the first dihedral structure of the differential form corresponding to the second times this rational function to the nth power. Okay, so that gives a family of, of integrals. So let's do an example. Um, So um, we have delta is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Delta prime is 1, 3, 5, 2, 4. And so you write down this, this uh, actually I'll, I'll do it, it's easier to do it here. here. Here you just take the successive difference in this ordering. So 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 4, 4, 5, 5, 1. That's just these points in this ordering, in this dihedral ordering. 
Um, and the second one, it's 1, 3, 3, 5, 5, 2, 2, 4, 4, 1. So in the order in which they're presented. There's a sign ambiguity, but I don't, I don't care about it. And now, um, with this... Oh, oh so these, yeah, I, I'm going to come to that later. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so in, for this example, then we, we re replace, the, we send Z1 to naught, Z4 to 1, and Z5 to infinity. So um, this is very easy to do. I mean, it's, it's very elementary what I'm saying. So Z1 minus Z2 is going to become uh, 0 minus T1. Z2 minus Z3 becomes T1 minus T2. Z3 minus Z4 becomes T2 minus 1. The next two terms have a Z5 in them, which is going to infinity. And that means that we, these, these factors are going to go to 1. We can just ignore the terms containing a Z5. So we pass the denominator, and we get Z1 minus Z3 is minus T2. And we keep going. And uh, you get this rational function coming out. And the differential form associated is just the product of the DTs and you take, it's going to be exactly the same denominator as the rational function. Okay, so this is really very um, elementary. And the family of basic cellular integrals are these. We integrate over the, the first cell, take this rational function to the n, and multiply by this form. And by the theorem, we know that this gives uh, multiple zeta values of weight at most 2. So it, gives, it can only give a linear form in 1 and zeta 2. There's nothing else it could give. And by construction, it vanishes to very high order on the domain of integration, on the boundary of the domain of integration. So it's going to go to zero very fast. It's going to give very good linear forms in 1 and zeta 2. What else could it be except Aperi's linear forms in 1 and zeta 2? So in fact, if you want to write this back as Boyka's integrals, you just do a change of variables. You get exactly Boyka's integrals on the nodes. Okay, so the warning, if, of course, the integral does not always converge. And as, as uh, Pierre pointed out, if you had success, if, if you had success as factors here, then you get cancellations. It would be terrible. So we want to understand for which pairs of dihedral orderings we're allowed to do this construction. And here, at long last, is the dinner table problem. Um, so suppose that we have n guests for dinner sitting on a circular table. So here they are. This is sort of before the picture. We have guests one to five sitting around. And they talk to each other. And it's boring to talk to the same people for the whole duration of the meal. So after the main course, you stand up and you move around. And, and you sit down in such a way that you're not sitting next to someone you sat to next to before. But I've actually played this in the UK. We often do, they sometimes do this to say the men move two seats to the left. So there's a, there's a unique solution. Uh, for n equals 5. So here, let's just check. So guest number 1 here talks to guest number 2 and guest number 5. And after the main course, guest number 1 talks to guest number 3 and guest number 4. So he's happy. He gets to talk to somebody new. So this is a very classical problem. Um, and the enumeration, this, this combinatorial problem, was solved, I think, by a mathematician called Poulet in 1919. Um, it actually satisfies a, 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 an amazing recurrence relation. Um, it's very surprising. So that problem is completely solved. But unfortunately, it's not good enough for this. We need a variant where um, you don't just talk to your neighbor. You could talk to your next to neighbor. You could, talk to, you could have people talking in a group. So imagine where we talk not to two people, but to K people. So <coughs> loud voices, absolutely. <laughs> so we need, we need the version where you can talk up to half the table. Okay? And so this is the same as the, the dinner table problem. Uh, up to seven guests. For eight guests, it's different. And here is an example after the main, so before the main course, it's one, two, three, up to eight in standard order. After the main course, it's, it's this ordering. And if here, no one is sitting next to a previous neighbor. So it's a solution to the classical dinner table problem. But it's bad because in the previous, so before the main course, we had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And the guests 1, 2, 3, and 4 were in a group. Maybe they were talking to each other. And guests 5 to 8 were just talking to each other separately. And again, after we've moved, we have the same problem because guests 1 to 4 are still talking to each other and ignoring um, the people on the other side. 
So that's bad, and we want to rule out things like that. So a, a convergent um, configuration will be one where there is no consecutive sequence of people which are consecutive simultaneously for delta and delta prime. Okay, so what is the geometric meaning of these basic cellular integrals? Um, so we have these two, two cells. The, one of the, cell, the first cell defines the domain of integration. The second cell defines a differential form. And the theorem you can prove is that this differential form has its singularities exactly contained in the boundary divisors of this cell. So it's in some sense dual to a cell. It's a differential form with, with the dual properties. And it's canonical up to a sign. And then the rational function f is uh, a rational function that vanishes the high order on the domain of integration and has its poles and has poles contained in these boundary divisors. It will actually have poles elsewhere as well, which complicates things. And of course, the symmetric groups act on the moduli space. So given these, these two pairs of, of cells, we can move them around, and this will define an equivalence relation on pairs of dihedral orderings. So we can apply an automorphism group uh, to the whole moduli space, and that gives us an equivalence relation. But that corresponds to a change of variables on the integrals, and so these basic cellular integrals only depend on this equivalence class of pairs of dihedral structures. And I didn't say it, but, but the integrals are finite if and only if this seating plan business uh, is satisfied. Okay, so because we can move these cells around, we can always assume that, that the, the domain of integration is just this standard cell. It's fairly clear. So as n goes to infinity, these, int these integrals go to zero very fast, and they give linear forms in multiple zeta values. And the observation, um, I can't quite prove this, i prove something similar, but that the, the vanishing, there's some weak vanishing in that the sub-maximum weight zeta values always drop out. So if, if um, we have something um, in degree 5, then, so this is, if this is on M08, we expect some multiple zetas of all weights up to weight 8. The things of weight, uh, all up to weight 5, then things of weight 4 will always drop out. Um, so that's how I thought up this construction. There's a way to interpret this in, in terms of Poincaré duality. but we'll get a lot more for free. So here's the enumeration of convergent configurations. Here's the number of guests. Here's the number of con the convergent dinner table configurations. It's unique for five and six. And then afterwards, it starts to proliferate enormously. So the theorem is for n equals five and six, there is a unique class of convergent configurations. And the basic cellular integrals give exactly Aperi's linear forms for the irrationality of zeta two and zeta three. So this, here you see the vanishing working, because for Aperi, we expect 1, Z2, Z3, and I get the sub-maximum terms. Starting from n equals 8, we find linear forms involving products, Z2 times Z3, as well as Z5, and so on. Theorem. So here's a, a family of configurations. Um, let, me, let me draw one example to see how it goes. So for the case n equals 8, we have eight, oh no, eight, seven, six, five, and I think we have one, two, three, oh no, it doesn't work. Um, okay, one, two, three, four, that doesn't work either, goodness. <laughs> I had to look at my notes, my apologies. Um, Okay, so it's 8, 7, 6, and 5 going one way, and then we start here in the opposite, or in the opposite direction, 1, 2, 3, 4. No, sorry, 1, 2, 3, 4, that's it. Okay, so that's an infinite family of configurations. And the theorem is that they give back exactly um, Ball and Rivoire's uh, forms in odd zeta values. 
So I started off with killing one of the coefficients. In fact, you get a whole lot more in this case. Um, and in fact, you get it in, in Fischler's case, there was a single integral that gave these two families. Um, here you have to have different configurations, and it shows that something tricky is going on. But there's another configuration which gives even, gives back the even uh, zeta values only. So this is some, somewhat of a fluke that I managed to find the change of variables that, that goes from this to um, the integrals we had before. There are other families of integrals, like um, Zorokin's integrals, for which I can't find the, the change of variables. So there appears to be a whole zoo of configurations with interesting vanishing properties. So what I can do is I can take the Ball and Rivoal um, configuration and, and switch the order of the, the, the before and after seating plans. And then I get something which is completely new. I get linear forms in just even zeta values and a single odd zeta value, essentially. And this, this for me is very um, interesting because from a certain sort of motivic point of view, I mean, you're trying to construct an extension, and, and you've kind of done it here. So, and there are, there are situations as in the periodic world, or when p equals infinity, um, there are notions of periods in which the pi's vanish. And then you just get linear forms in one and a single odd zeta. So I think that this, there's something going on here that's interesting. Generalized cellular integrals. So now we can um, generalize the picture and in the change the definition of f tilde and introduce um, indices in the numerators. And these are any integers, but you just choose them in such a way that the expression is homogeneous, so that it's a well-defined function on projective space. And then every basic cellular integral now is part of a huge family of integrals with uh, n parameters. Theorem, the generalized integrals for n equals 5 and n equals 6 are exactly equivalent to the Rhin and Viola integrals for zeta 2 and zeta 3. Um, so the slogan is that the dinner party game generates <laughs> all known irrationality results. So I, I'm a bit slightly dishonest here. I didn't check. So we've got Lindemann's theorem, all Rivoel's theorem, Aperi's theorem, Rhin Viola's theorem. I didn't check Zudidin's theorem but I'm fairly confident that, that, that it, it fits. It's just a lot of work to, to, to compare the existing integrals and put them into this setting. So we get a lot more, though. But these integrals for these configurations here, we actually get... So Born and Rivoel just had a, a one, or essentially two-parameter family of integrals. Here we get, for example, an eight-parameter family of integrals. It has a rich group structure, like in Rhin Viola, and I'm sure we can do get better approximations than in than the Born and Rivoel picture. So there's, there's some new things to explore here as well. Um, and of course, we get Picard Fuchs recurrences. Every family of these basic cellular integrals gives you a Picard Fuchs equation. So for every dinner table seating plan, you get a canonical Picard Fuchs equation that gives exactly apéry and then spawns some huge family afterwards. It has a lot of nice properties. One is, is Poincaré duality, which is that you can, there's a notion of dual dinner party seating plan, where you just switch the before and after pictures around, and you get the dual Picard Fuchs equation. I have to say what that means, the dual Picard Fuchs, but it's... it's uh, how, how do I... So Picard Fuchs uh, recurrence... So, so yeah, uh, the parameter is this. Um, so I have I n delta slash delta prime integral f to the n ignoring signs um, delta prime delta and so um, the, the, the family is 1 over 1 minus t f delta over delta prime so we've got a hyperplane and and this is the generating, sorry, sorry, this is that's not equal, this is equal to, so this thing is equal to the, the generating series t to the n i n delta over delta prime, certainly when t is less than 1, for example. And so the, the, a recurrence relation on these numbers here is equivalent to a differential equation on, on this generating series. And actually this is tricky because this, this is a relative cohomology group, and, and, but it, the inhomogeneous equation is, is, has this duality. 
something I find very surprising, given two different dinner table con configurations and some mild condition on them, there's a way to merge them to get a third one. And this defines a way to multiply um, these integrals. And you find that the, the, um, the integral for the, for the new dinner table configuration is actually the product of the previous ones. Um, so there's a multiplicative structure, which is uh, slightly surprising because um, these integrals don't look as if they multiply in any way at all. And finally, there are a lot of relations. So often for different um, dinner table configurations, you get equivalent picard flux equations. They're exactly the same. And I don't understand why that's the case. So the, uh, the conclusion of the, the lecture is that if you have guests for a dinner party and the conversation runs dry, then <laughs> you can make everyone change seats and explain to the relish of your guests that this generates lots of irrationality results. <laughs>